Okay, we will go ahead and get started. And I am so happy to see uh, so many names over there in the attendees list. Um, I want to welcome you to the first want to welcome you to the first ever Science and Ag Week virtual programming for Arizona 4-H. We are really excited this week to present uh, some great presentations throughout the week uh, for you to engage with and think about and just kind of stir your, uh, your STEM thinking and science thinking as it relates to um, agricultural contexts in and around Arizona. So um, the way these presentations will work is that uh, there will be a host, in this case it's me, um, and in a few other days there will be uh, some others, and we will introduce the topic and the format and do a little bit of housekeeping and let you know how this works, and then we'll introduce our panelists and um, give them an opportunity to share their expertise with us. Um, as it relates to the, um, the engagement that you can have during these sessions, you can feel free to use the chat box just as you would in other Zoom meetings, if you're familiar with those. If you're not, you simply click the little icon at the bottom of the screen that says chat. I'll do this for you now, and I'm going to chat um, everyone and just say welcome. And you can send, um, you can send out your thoughts uh, if the panelists ask, hey, let us know how many of you have um, done X, Y, or Z. Uh, you can type in X and then we'll see those in the chats and know that you've responded. We also have a feature with this webinar that you may or may not have used in other virtual connections, but you can use the Q&A icon at the bottom that gives you an opportunity to type in a question. And then we as panelists will see those questions and we'll do our best to get those answered. If there are questions that are left unanswered by the end of our time today, uh, we'll do our best to share those. Uh, I'll certainly share those with our panelists and get answers to you and do our best to uh, either get the answer back to you directly or share the question and answer with the content as we put it online. When the, the session is finished today, um, we will be working with the recording and we will make it available online. Uh, so if during the presentation you start to think about somebody else who may be interested or benefit from this content, you can feel free to share it, um, share links to that content with them. So we're going to kick this off. Um, as I, you've read when you registered and online, the Science and Ag Week is all about understanding scientific ways of thinking and how they are applied in various agricultural contexts. And um, we have today our topic of sustainability. I'm super excited about this uh, particular topic, and, um, and I've been working with our two panelists uh, for a few days on this. So I know they're excited as well, and I think uh, we should be proud to have them with us. Uh, so as I introduce them, I want to let you know that we have two panelists who are graduate students, uh, both PhD students working with a project uh, at the University of Arizona and New Mexico State University called SBAR, or Sustainable Bioregions for our sustainable bioeconomy for arid regions, and they are developing curriculum for teachers to use uh, within classrooms around Arizona and New Mexico. So excited to have these two, and uh, let me share just a few notes about both of them. So our first panelist is Karina Guadalupe Martinez Molina. She's a current PhD student at the Arid Lands Resource Sciences Department in the University of Arizona. Uh, she completed her master's study in development practice and programs at the at University of Arizona and she currently works as a research assistant in or worked as a research assistant uh, in the Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy uh, while getting her master's. We're very excited to welcome her and our second panelist for today is Tenzin Fakdon. She is a third year PhD student in environmental engineering from the University of Arizona. She's earned her bachelor's in civil engineering from the Government Engineering College in India and a master's in environmental engineering from the University of Arizona, uh, which was funded by TSP scholarships under the Fulbright program. Her research focuses on reclamation of wastewater and brine discharge. Uh, two experts in their field, uh, we're super excited to welcome them 
And I think a number of you have seen me in programs. I probably should have introduced myself by now. Uh, but I'm Dr. Nick Morris. I work as a program specialist for Arizona 4-H. And it's part of my role to make sure really awesome engagements like this happen for kids around the state of Arizona. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Karina and Tenzin. Hi. Let me share my presentation. <clears throat> Hi, my name is uh, Tenzin Pakton, and I'm an environmental engineering PhD student from University of Arizona. Today, we're going to talk about this topic called sustainability. As you all must have heard, you know, sustainability means to sustain something, to keep something going, and to understand it better, um, let's see what is an unsustainable practice. So there are millions of people around the world who live on less than three gallons of water each day. And guess how much an average American uses? So on average, we use 160 gallons of water each day, and a quarter of that is used to flush our toilet. So millions and billions of people do not have access to clean water, and we're using that to flush our toilet. And this does not make sense, and there must be a smarter way to understand it better. Uh, we need to understand what is sustainability. Uh, sustainability basically means um, how should we manage our resources so that our kids and grandkids can have a good life. So our practices and our actions should be smart and efficient when we do things. So uh, look at these two images of two forests um, and we're going to consider two scenarios. The first scenario would be, if we're only concerned about environmental sustainability, how many trees should we ideally cut down? Mm. Ideally, it would be none. If we don't cut any trees, we will be uh, able to uh, sustain our environment, but then that means we wouldn't have any wood to build our houses, our furnitures, and for different resources. So, Let's consider a second scenario. If we were to focus only on short-term profit of making money, how much trees would a normal businessman cut down? Um, a typical answer would be all of them. We would cut down all the trees and make money, but then it would be harmful for our environment. So sustainability is basically this balance between these different needs between uh, to survive our to sustain our environment and to survive our needs. It is the interrelationship between uh, economy, environment, and our social needs. These are collectively known as the three pillars of sustainability, which we're going to discuss further. And these are also known as uh, the three P's, where uh, uh, P stands for people, the planet, and profit. Uh, to understand environmental sustainability, we should go back to this definition of sustainability, which means uh, it tries to secure present needs without compromising future generations. And how do we do that? Um, environmental sustainability is concerned with this um, assumption that we have that nature and environment are limitless. So ex extracting it limitlessly uh, it's going to harm it, so we need to protect them and use them rationally. It is uh, important to understand that environmental sustainability involves the entire global ecosystem, which comprises of our oceans, freshwater systems, land, and atmosphere. However, environmental sustainability principles can equally be applied to ecosystems of any size, even down to the scale of a small home garden. So our individual actions matter as well. So our second topic, uh, social sustainability. Sustainability also promotes social development, which means unity between the community and cultures to achieve satisfactory ways of life, which means a good quality of life and health and education for everybody. A socially sustainable society is one in which 
all members have equal rights and they share equal equitably in social benefits and all participate equally in the process of decision making process. A bad example of an unsustainable society would be uh, a society that consumes its resources faster than nature can renew it and it produces and discharges more waste than nature can absorb without degrading it. And thirdly, sustainability focuses on equal economic growth that generates wealth for all without harming the environment. Uh, so we need to carefully consider the full life cycle of the goods that we use from our day, in our day-to-day -day life. Let's consider the life cycle of a pencil that we use. Approximately 14 billion pencils are made each year and it goes through multiple uh, levels of extraction, uh, beginning with uh, the graphite, which is the pencil lead. It is made out of graphite and clay, which are derived from rocks. And normally, um, industrialists use explosives to uh, break the rocks, which is harmful for the environment. And even the uh, wood on our pencil, it is derived from cedar wood, uh, which is a soft wood. Fortunately, cedar wood grows um, in a period of one to two years. So companies can ideally plant new trees for each tree they cut down. But unfortunately, unfortunately, not all companies grow trees sustainably. As such, they in destroy the environment. So it is really important to understand that it takes a lot of energy and material to make just one single pencil. We need to consider the social and eco ecological consequences of economic activity. Coming back to the three pillars of sustainability, nowadays many of our challenges that humans face, such as climate change or water scarcity, can only be, can only be tackled by promoting sustainable development on an individual level and eventually on a global scale as well. Okay, um, so we're gonna take a look back to ancient Arizonans. Um, have you? heard about the Hohokam people? About uh, 1,500 years ago, Hohokam people lived in southern Arizona. They lived along the Lower Salt River near now Phoenix. For about 1,000 years, these people formed in southern Arizona where they had rivers and streams that ran at least part of the years. And as you can see from the picture, Hohokam people drained uh, the river water from the Salt River using uh, multiple canals followed by distribution canals and then they irrigated their farms. This method of irrigation is called flood water farming. And here's another picture of the canals built by Hohokam people. Um, and interestingly, uh, historically, Hohokam, uh, uh, Hohokam people are famous for the irrigation system. Um, they, were, they built really complex irrigation system in this uh, Salt Gila River basin, as you can see um, in the map. The blue line in the middle is the Salt River, and these purple lines that look like tributaries coming out of these are the canals and the distribution canals. So uh, historians have found out that um, Hohokam built uh, around 300 miles of major canals on the Salt River and around 700 miles of smaller distribution canals um, on the Salt River as well. An interesting fact about the Salt River is that, as the name suggests, it is one of the saltiest rivers in North America, uh, which is salt, which is usually not good for um, planting crops. So why do you think the Hohokam built their irrigation system on such a salty river. Um, this is a map of uh, modern day Phoenix. And as you can see, um, Hohokam lived around the Phoenix area. Okay, moving forward. So historians believe that most likely Hohokam built the used to um, cultivate a mesquite bosk, as you can see in this image. This is a mesquite tree as we commonly see them all around here in Tucson and in Arizona. Uh, these mesquite tree um, can handle 
really high levels of salt water. So they're able to grow uh, even with high salt in their water. And um, how come people were believed to use this uh, mesquite boss, uh, as you can see on the top, the, um, the grains for food purposes, and then uh, the wood for firewood and furnitures uh, to make furnitures. In addition to mesquite bosque, uh, how come people were um, believed to harvest bean and corn, even though they're moderately sensitive to salt water? Um, historians also found out that uh, Hohokam built really deep canals. Some of the canals were very deep, way below the root systems of bean and corn, but it would have been ideal for a mesquite as they have deep tap roots which can reach the, those deep canals and then at the same time it would uh, reduce uh, water loss due to evaporation as well. Around 300 to 700 AD, these farmers lived in these huge villages and settlements, as you can see in this artist's um, uh, image of Hohokam community. They acquired cultivated plants like cotton and tapiri beans from Mexico, and they hunted as well as harvested wild plants for their food source as well. As their population grew, they, it resulted in changes in the community, and we're going to discuss it further. Uh, we call it the people who vanished. Uh, Hohokam word, which is an anglicization of the word huhugam, which is an autumn word that they used to describe their ancestors. Uh, it, the word means they are no longer living in the plane of existence, or more commonly referred to as people who vanished. So what happened to the Hohokam people? Hohokam people lived in Arizona for about a thousand years until the year 1450 AD and all of a sudden the population started to decline. Why do you think the Hohokam abandoned their homes and their settlements? Do you think they moved or vanished? Uh, please respond in the chat below if you think they moved or they vanished. Um, okay. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's see what the historians think. Uh, most historians believe that Hohokam people eventually moved. And even the people from Tohono O'odham Nation call the Hohokam their ancestors. So they must have migrated to uh, Southern Arizona and parts of Mexico. So what would be the reason that they moved from these like really intensive, uh, after building such intensive irrigation canals and settlements in the Phoenix area? So there are two possible reasons. According to a research article by Fink, uh, he thinks that there might have been waterborne infectious disease due to direct excretion and urination into the water, uh, which could have caused the move. Um, the best guess would be a water sustainability issues of Hohokam people. As, as, um, as displayed here on the slide, there were a number of floods in the year 899 and 1080s, and eventually, in the year 1358, uh, a major flood ultimately destroyed the canal networks. And um, in addition, they couldn't survive the constant cycle of drought and flood that we still struggle to this day in Arizona. So over time, they just slowly moved away. Um, now my colleague Karina would uh, take a contemporary perspective the water issues of Arizona that we face today. I'll stop sharing. Okay. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Karina Martinez, and I'm a PhD student from the Air Alliance Resource Science Department, and I will continue this presentation with a contemporary perspective of sustainability in Arizona. Uh, so let's start with a simple question. Uh, do you know where Ash is coming from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so anyone, we can use a chat to um, try to answer the question, where the water comes from in Arizona. I can't see if they're responding. Um, okay, well, um, most, well, okay, a part of uh, our water comes from in-state rivers, also uh, the Colorado River, groundwater, and we also have um, reclaimed water. But what percentage do we get from each one of these um, uh, supplies? Uh, so in-state rivers provide 21% of the water that we use. Reclaim water, it's only 3%. Uh, the Colorado River provides 36% of the water in the state of Arizona. And then the majority of the water that we use in the state of Arizona comes from aquifers. So that represents 40% of the water that we use um, in a year. And so now that we know where the water comes from, now let's think about where the water goes to, which sectors use um, the water in the state of Arizona. Uh, I think it's also important to mention that uh, some counties such as Mojave, La Paz, and Yuma, they relied on the Colorado River as the principal water supply instead of groundwater uh, resources like other places of the state. Um, Okay, so let's move on then to where the water goes to once we have it. Okay, so I have a question for you guys and hopefully you can try to answer in the chat. Hopefully you can see the responses. Um, so which sector do you think uses more water? Is it the municipal sector, industrial sector, or the agricultural sector? We'll give you a few minutes to respond. Agriculture, yes. Actually, so agriculture is the one that takes the majority of the water resources from the state. And only the agricultural sector uses, I'm oh, sorry, 74% of the water. And then on the second place, we have the municipal sector, which uses 21%. And then we have the industrial sector, which uh, uses 5% of our water resources. And you might think, uh, why so much of the Arizona water supply goes to irrigate crops in the desert? Why? Does that make sense? Well, um, a partial answer to this question is that the state of Arizona provides two of the three prerequisites to grow crops. And the three prerequisites are a lot of sunshine, high quality soils, and enough water. And the state of Arizona provides the first two. And although, um, Irrigated agriculture has been part of this desert landscape for more than a thousand years. Uh, the lack of sufficient rainfall in the desert to grow most of the crops uh, forced agriculture to um, use groundwater resource in order to be able to grow crops and to create the industry in the state of Arizona. So, in Arizona, the agriculture sector consumes 70% of the Colorado River allotment. 
which means that from that 36% that I mentioned on the previous slide, we, the, on the previous slide, um, the municipal and industrial sector, they only get 10.8% of the Colorado River allotment. So this means that farmers and rancher, they use more water than cities. But I think it's also important to mention that they do produce the food and fiber that we need. So let's move on to the following slide. And let's take 15 seconds. We'll see um, which method do you think is the most used in the state of Arizona? A, which is flood irrigation, or B, which is drip irrigation? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so flood irrigation is the most used method in the state of Arizona. And it is because it requires low initial, initial investment. And the problem with this is that it's the least efficient method of irrigation because most of the water gets uh, lost um, from evaporation and also from runoff. And the drip irrigation system uh, applies smaller quantities of water directly to the base of the plant rather than uh, flooding the entire field. Um, but this method also uh, reduces, this method reduces the loss of water caused by evaporation. And the most traditional method, which is flood irrigation, uh, has been the cause of conflict in many places because it requires a large amount of water to produce crops. And in places like Arizona, which are desert places, um, water cannot be waste, you know. We, we need to be able to uh, save as much as we can because we don't have a lot of reliable sources of water. And now I'm gonna move on to the case of the Pop family. Uh, and this is a really uh, clear example of competitive needs. Okay. So, uh, the Pop family, this is the Pop family. Uh, so this family moved to the state of Arizona to the Sulphur Spring Valley in July of 2014 and they purchased a home that had a private well and this was the primary source of water for this family and on one of the first day the first days that they were moving into this house um they were unpacking and of course you know it's july uh we live in a desert area so uh, the mother Lori, she got thirsty and you know she decided to get a glass of water and what was her surprise? Oh, sorry, it doesn't show there. Uh, she noticed that the stream from the tap was cloudy and brown, and in her glass, she found what looked like grains of sand. And this happened for several days. The dirty water came out first, and then, after a few minutes, then it looked clean. And I wonder, would you drink if you were so thirsty? and this is your only source of water. Would you drink a glass of water that looked like that? Yeah, and this is the problem, right? This can be a problem. So a few days later, um, so this happened for a few days, but then it got to the point where there was no, no water coming out of the faucet and it was sand and they thought that maybe something was wrong with the system and they decided to check everything and they realized that everything was actually working correctly but then what was the problem what do you think was causing this no water only sand coming out of your uh, pipes what do you think happened use the chat to type an answer. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you, Haley. So turns out that the aquifer had withdrawn uh, 
the lower the whale could reach it. And they realized very soon that they were not the only ones in this situation. At least 100 families across the whole valley had the same problem. Either they, the well went dry or it was not working right. Um, so they were in the same situation as a pop family. This, we're talking that those wells are the primarily source of water for the families. And because of it, the government had to intervene. This, this was a big problem. So it turns out um, that the aquifer had withdrawn and then uh, this was the government response. They said, we cannot put more water in the aquifer. It, it's not possible for us. So the only um, option for homeowners is to invest and to chase the water downward and deepen their wells a few hundred feet. And I mean, it sounds like, you know, like easy, right? But the cost of doing this was really high. And the cost was between $50,000 and $30,000. And that's a lot of money, especially in rural communities like this. Um, so the, ha the family had to make a decision and they had to decide between uh, the expensive option, which was to uh, do the investment or they could do a behavior change. Which one do you think the family went for? I'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Okay. So the family decided that um, it was really expensive and they couldn't afford this. So they decided to do a behavior change. And just to uh, give you an idea, a Phoenix household um, uses more than 540 gallons per day. And this family, they already had a water consumption culture. So they, this family already, uh, they were consuming 100 gallons per day of water before this happened. Um, they were used to this. And because of this situation, they had to reduce that water consumption to only 50 gallons per day. Can you imagine, you know, living your life with only 50 gallons of water per day? You know, if you have to do your laundry, if you want to shower, if you want to clean, if you want to cook, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you need to change in order to meet this goal. And, you know, the situation in the Sulphur Spring Valley, it's, it's, really, it's really sad because a lot of families have been displaced. But I think it's also important to mention that there's a lot of other families and other places in the world that are going through the exact same situation. And this is very sad. So what are some of the challenges that we're facing right now? So I want you to describe what you observed in this picture. This is a picture from Phoenix, Arizona. You can use a chat to comment what you see. Give you a few seconds. Tell me what you see in this picture. Props, very good. What else? Yes, irrigation, okay. Mm -hmm. We also see um, housing developments, right? Right next to the agriculture field. Yeah, exactly. Homes. Perfect. Yeah. And do you think this is good or this is bad to have this type of situations in the communities? Do you think it's good? It's bad? Both? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, the agriculture sector creates a lot of jobs directly and also indirectly. And agriculture is needed for growing cities. But this 
can create really tense situations because a growing city will demand more water, but it will demand also more food. And this can become a subject of conflict in many places. And just as the pop family, farmers also face the same decisions. Uh, they have to decide if, they, if they're gonna do um, expensive investments to reduce the water use, or they have to do drastic changes in the production process because now they need to reduce their water, but they still need to make a profit. And um, sadly, only 5% of farmers in the state of Arizona can use drip irrigation. And this is because the cost of the system and the maintenance can be expensive. And I mean, it can be an option for some farmers, but it might be too expensive for others it, that they're trying to make a profit from the crops they're producing. So how much water can a farmer um, save with the drip irrigation? How much water do you think they save? Give a, try to guess. We can use a chat, like 10%, 75%, okay. Anyone else? 10, 50, okay, that's closer. 50 is close. So some researchers um, say that the water consumption can be reduced up to 40%, but the actual water saving will vary. And this is because it depends on the crop that, you, that you're growing, the techniques that you use to plant it, and also how well you maintain the irrigation systems. And as we can, as, let me see if I can go back a little bit. Um, as we can see in this slide, the drip irrigation uh, system uses a lot of really tiny uh, tubes and these tubes are plastic. And what happens is that, as we can see, these fields are huge. They're very, 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 very big fields. And what happens is that in order for you to uh, make sure that everything is working correctly, you need to basically check or monitor the system every once in a while because these tubes are, are tiny and also animals, they like to bite this tube. So if animals um, break the tubes, then we have a leak and you need to be able to identify the leaks as soon as possible in order for, it, for you to uh, save the water. So, um, um, do you think that farmers have more options to save water? Please use a chat to tell us if you think there are other options. Yeah, okay, sure. Well, um, yeah, well, we have sciences at the University of Arizona and also the New Mexico State University. And they're trying to help farmers to find new crop options that will require less water, but that can be also profitable, such as water in Wayuli. Um, so with this information, uh, I would like to ask a few questions. Um, do you think that Arizona is a sustainable or unsustainable society nowadays. What do you think? Sustainable, okay. Yeah. So another question, um, do you think that agricultural activity in Arizona right now is economically sustainable? Yeah, I think uh -huh, maybe that's, that's true. I, I think that uh, we're starting to implement uh, a lot of ways to be more sustainable, but we still have a long uh, path. So I have a, also another question. Um, do you think that the Sulphur Spring Valley community 
do you think they will face a similar fate as the Hohokam community? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we don't, if we don't save enough water, then it might, who knows, we can do a lot of things to prevent that from happening. So, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on and so there are many uh, professional careers that can contribute on solving problems like the ones that we are currently facing. And there are careers at the government level, community level, and also individual level. And it is really important to mention that the role of the federal government is to pass laws that protect human health and also the environment, but they also have to create um, regulations in order to, to enforce these laws. And some of the examples of these of careers in this field are auditions and also um, positions at, agent, as, at government agencies such as EPA, which is the Environmental Protection, Protection Agency of the United States. And also the role of the community is to make, um, uh, to make full use of environmental law in order to protect and to be able to make decisions about the local environment and also to ensure that uh, the available legal remedies are effective uh, in scope and also accessibility. And some of the examples at this level are nonprofits, non-governmental agencies, and of course, a lot of the research centers. And at the individual level, there's many ways that we can do to help. Uh, we can start by reducing our water consumption, reducing our energy, uh, starting to recycle, reducing, reducing or reusing waste, and also planting trees, taking care of the environment. There are many, many things that we can do to help. And at this level, we have careers as researchers, farmers, community leaders, and also activists. So I have a question. Um, do you see yourself working in any of these fields in the future? Please use the chat box to comment. If so, where do you see yourself and what kind of work would you like to do? Anyone else? Anyone wants to work with water, maybe uh, agriculture or air quality? Agriculture, yeah. It's really, I think it's, it's really important and we, we need to find a way to balance our needs and our demands in this community. Well, um, very good, very good. Um, okay, awesome, awesome responses. Um, well, uh, this would be all from us. Uh, do you have any uh, questions or comments from the presentation? We still have a few minutes left. You can feel free to type any questions that you have into the, uh, just tap that Q&A icon and type those and um, I will read them out loud and if I know the answer, I'll type it in and if not, um, Karina and Tenzin can add their thoughts. Uh, there was one question already in there about what the other um, programs are for the week. I will go over that as we wrap up today. Oh. No other questions oh, in this one. All right, well, let me just take a, um, a few minutes and um, kind of summarize some things and, um, and put together a little takeaway for you. Um, I want you, you know, to recognize that, um, and first of all, 
I should say thank you, uh, Karina and Tenzin for sharing uh, your research with us and the work that you're doing to uh, help educate young people all across um, Arizona and New Mexico on issues of sustainability and, um, and the economy and how to create, uh, create opportunities for folks that are sustainable in the long run. Uh, it's a really, really valuable work that you're doing. You know, when we talk about our programs for this week, we're, we we want to take away, you know, where what the science is in this agriculture. And sustainability is a little bit different. Sustainability forces us to think even outside of the, the science perspective and makes us think about people and our social sustainability. And it also makes us think um, about the economy and the money that's available uh, to, to sustain a society. You know, those decisions that uh, the Hohoka made to respond to drought and um, and and water issues and, and movement away. We don't we don't have those issues uh, today in, for a lot of folks. You know, it's wasn't it wasn't easy for the Pulp family to um, to arrive in an area, discover that they have a lack of water, and they weren't necessarily able to relocate. Um, there are were other families, as was mentioned, who did and. That's a similar experience that people have had in Arizona for thousands of years. Um, we have in you know, each of those three pillars um, or, or three, um, three perspectives on sustainability, the economy, the environment, and, um, and society, they all intermingle and, and impact one another. And that image that Karina mentioned about uh, that showed the crops and the housing development right next to it. Um, you know, the housing development, they have needs, obviously, it's a growing community or else that farm field wouldn't have been turned into housing. Um, but part of their need is to have food and to have uh, space. And, um, and so there's this responsibility that oftentimes, uh, especially when we see certain bits of data that say things like, oh, 75% of the water goes to agriculture. Wow, they must be doing something wrong. No, it means that they have a lot of responsibility. And farmers and, and ranchers out in all across Arizona are working really hard to, to take that responsibility into consideration because they know that if they misuse the resources that are available to them, that they, they damage the future sustainability of their, uh, of their ag business. So really great science happening all across, uh, all across agriculture when it comes to sustainability. The drip irrigation systems, um, that's a, you know, a unique en engineer product that can be put out into the field and make things easier. But again, uh, the decisions have to take into consideration the economy uh, as well. And so maybe you can, maybe you can't do that. There are some farmers who have come up with some rather simple solutions. Uh, for example, if you, um, Karina, could you go back to maybe that picture with the, the, um, the crops and the housing development? Right there. So if you look right above the words, you see that um, that sprinkler uh, that sprinkler system that rolls across the field and it sprays the water out over the plants. Well, there's plenty of farmers who've recognized that as that water is sprayed out over top of the plants, some of it evaporates. So they've simply created longer tubes that drop down from the sprinkler system so that it is sprinkling near the base of the plant just as the drip systems would do. So instead of reinvesting in an entirely new system, they are able to adapt what they're currently doing and make decisions. So I, I'm really glad that we were able to see that these sorts of decisions, whether it's you know, working with a, a PhD water specialist from the University of Arizona, uh, working with a farmer or rancher, or it's traditional agriculture knowledge, like we saw with the Hohokam uh, communities and how they were able to um, make decisions to uh, create a thriving space for their people. Um, those things happen on a regular basis. So there's plenty of science in the agriculture that's going around. And that's part of the lesson to take away. So if we look at it from sustainability, what I think is important is in science, we look at problems, we collect information, we consider all of the variables, and we try things out. When it comes to sustainability, when you're thinking about um, the, the, the bigger picture, that science starts to incorporate those other perspectives. 
And so there has to, you look a little bit forward to, oh, if we made that decision, we could save money, but it might impact the environment or it might impact society. So the decisions have much, many more variables to include. And it's important if we think sustainable to, sustainably to consider all of those. Um, these are complex issues that are happening out in Arizona, especially when we talk about things like uh, as competitive as water and as, um, as necessary as water. And um, I think Karina and Tenzin have presented us with uh, a nice introduction to that. And I, I challenge you to think about that moving forward. Some of you are out, uh, you, you go out to the, um, to the barn to, uh, to take care of the, the pigs that you're raising for the fair, or you are growing plants for, the, um, for your horticulture projects, or maybe you feed and water and take care of your horses for the uh, 4-H equine project. Think about water the next time you walk out and you see that the bucket has spilled over or that there's a leak in the, in the hose that's, um, that's providing water to your animals or to your plant projects. And recognize that you, can, you have a moment to, to make a scientific decision, take into consideration what are all the variables, you've got a problem in front of you, gather some data about, you know, well, we could replace the whole hose, or we could just do the same thing we're doing and disregard the water loss, or we could just stop watering our animals and plants. Well, that wouldn't work very well. So I think we want to, um, to take that opportunity to consider, just as our, our agriculture specialists out in the field do today, how will the decision, as simple as it is, to just fix a leak in a hose uh, as it's watering your, your animals or your plants, that decision has impacts that are broader than just keeping water uh, on our plants and our animals. So you can play a role and participate in sustainability decisions on, on your farm, in your 4-H projects, and in your community, and I encourage you to do so. The last thing I will do is I'm going to just type up um, the, oh, there's a couple other questions. Oh, great question, Hadley. Where can you find the recorded meeting? We will be putting these meetings up on our 4-H uh, virtual programs website. Um, at, at some point, they'll be available on our YouTube channel as well, uh, but we will, um, we will also be sharing some things through social media to help you find those spaces, so, uh, or find those resources. Nick? Yes. Um, we had another question about the dirty water, like water from the toilet goes into ah. rivers or ocean. I can Great. answer that. Please do, please do. Um, so what happens to the dirty water is, uh, it goes to the drain and it gets pumped, uh, all of our wastewater gets pumped to the wastewater treatment plant. Here in Tucson, we have two. Uh, one is called Agua Nueva and one, another one is called uh, Tres Rios. So uh, my research center is over there. So what they do is they clean the water to, there are three phases, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And we only do the first two, primary and secondary. And after that, tertiary means you do like UV light and it's more expensive and then you can drink it afterwards too. But we only do two phases of cleaning and then we uh, discharge it back into the river. So the, uh, if, you've, if you've biked on the bike path, uh, there's a tiny creek that goes and all year round, almost most of the time there's water and it's because the toilet water gets cleaned and it gets, uh, and we pump it back into the, river and sometimes we even use it as purple water. I don't know if you have seen it at, at University of Arizona. If you go to the mall, uh, all the pipes are, the pipes that are colored in purple are the toilet water that were cleaned. So we do use our waste, uh, dirty water. And I think in Karina's uh, uh, pie chart, there was like reclaimed water. That's the toilet water. We call it reclaimed. And we usually use, use it to, uh, water our gardens and um, to recharge the rivers. Thank you. That was a, a great question and a great answer. Um, along the same lines, I, I would like to add that um, part of the sustainability decision making that we can do um, can address the water that does go into rivers and oceans and can hurt um, the plants and animals. And that is rainwater uh, and stormwater runoff. 
Um, so if you live in a neighborhood that has, um, you know, going down the street, there's a little spot uh, where there, you know, when it rains, it, it washes off the street and into some mysterious place. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a, some people think that that water then ends up being collected somewhere and cleaned, and it doesn't. That stormwater and that stormwater simply is drained away from people and put back out into nature. So if there's trash, if there's oil, if there's pollution in that water, when it disappears down that stormwater drain, that's what's being carried with it out into our washes and our rivers. So um, keeping that, the stormwater clean once it lands on our, uh, on our, on our properties and in our homes um, helps to make sure that the water that's out there available in nature is clean. So we have answered that one, answered that one. Um, are there any other questions regarding sustainability or water? <laughs> yes, great, Hadley, don't litter. Uh, and better yet, um, clean up a little bit of litter that you find. Um, I always try when I like to hike and when I go out to the trails, I like to try to keep an extra little bag with me to uh, pick up some things that are left behind. It's called clogging, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you uh, for your attention, your questions, your participation. Really excited to have you part of this today. Um, in terms of what's coming ahead, tomorrow there will be a plant science presentation that is led by two other graduate students, uh, just like Karina and Tenzin. On Wednesday from 10 to 11, we will have an equine science presentation that's going to be delivered by Dr. Betsy Green from the University of Arizona. On Thursday, uh, we will have a, a livestock slash dairy presentation from uh, Dr. Duarte from the University of Arizona. And on Friday, we will have food safety uh, from the farm to the table from uh, Dr. Jerry Lopez at the University of Arizona. So all great partners uh, of us here at Arizona 4-H and we're super excited to have them engage with you. So again, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your engagement and I wish you a wonderful day. Bye, thank Bye. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Karina and Tenzin.